give a round of applause to the illustrious Sapient Soul. Hi, y'all doing? Hi. Hi. Everybody good? Yep, yep. Good. I am going to call out here to start out with me, uh, one of my teammates, um, lover, friend, all of those things. Um, but as far as <laughs> our our team, we're, we're a poetry slam team. And so we're two th we're two fifths of the team tonight. And um, I say all of that to say that Catherine's like, who's coming with you so I can put on the fly? It's like, I don't know. Because everybody like has jobs by day and then poetry by night. And you kind of wait right. to the very last minute. It's like, okay, who's going? And so it's us. And so we're going to do um, a group poem. And, and uh, she's going to open up the show. And then I'll get started with y'all. He asked me, if I thought the cheapening of life is what has led to the increase in child abuse today, he said, you know, not to be political, but if we didn't have all of these abortions, child abuse just wouldn't be happening. Funny, he sought to correct independent choice while simultaneously reminding me of my independence. Funny. Funny. How the smartest people sometimes say the dumbest things. Funny how one can defend what works for them and make judgments on situations that penises have yet to face. If, if he wanted, wanted my body, body all he had, had to do was say so because y'all, he must want my body. He must want to drink from my forbidden nectars that pour monthly like sacrifice. Is it the smell of right blood that entices you? Women, Women have bled unequal since the day God was gendered. His majesty, the majestic penis running things making big penis decisions like women masturbation is a sin menstruation will allow impregnation is your designation like down and birth this nation because i said so unless unless <clears throat> you're a white christian man running for office with mpc that would be majestic penis complex. <laughs> Sit your ass down somewhere and raise those kids your work is, is at, at home, home woman don't climb Better ride that magical dick on the way to the top because ladies, they, they just want your body. They must want your body. See, the cheapening of life, sir. The cheapening of life began in 1619. Jamestown, Virginia, to be exact. So, sir, your declaration of independence can kiss the darkest spaces of my... Sarah Bartman, my, Sally Hemings, my, Carrie Butler, my, Lena Baker, because I remember when African women were carved like cows. Fetuses sliced from abdomen like blood diamonds. So forcibly rape this, hysterectomy that. Why doesn't the cheapening of life apply to men who dip dick in holes with no hold, no bars, no protection? Funny, it takes two to tango, but you're too busy tangling webs of confusion. Funny, how you, dirty old money with urge to oppress, can speak on the cheapening of life. So next time, next time, next time you decide to not be political, take, take the, the time to get to know me first before, before trying, trying to, to get this body. body. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm feeling really proud, like it wasn't too much stumbling, it's a little Jeez. bit shaky. But y'all are going to hear a lot of flower for a little bit, and I will be back. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Y'all scare me. Why? Why? Y'all are great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everybody got up here, and they're like, this is my first time, this is poem I just wrote. I'm like, wow, y'all make me happy. Good. <laughs> Everybody, I'm, I know how nervous you can get trying to do it, so oh, for sure. I just wanted to say y'all are great. Um, okay. What do you do when you become a stranger in your own backyard and get buried at the foot of someone else's soapbox that they stood too proudly upon? What do you do when you've given up your fight? When you become comfortable with keeping your head down and accepting the punches with a smile, can you forgive yourself for not dying a fighter, but rather lying down like a bitch for snuffing out these sparks of revolution because it sounds too much like rebellion to them? Mm -hmm. What will you tell your brothers? How much longer will we allow ignorance and the form of government harm our children with every supported gunshot to a Sean Bell? 
how will you let yourself be erased in this country? This nation sings of liberty. Yet still isms of race, sex, humanity exist. We all drum to that beat of in God we trust while another child sees their chapters closed behind the boards of a wooden box while their voices are being stifled in this pledge of allegiance. Tell me, in what God do you trust? Does his name sound like money? Does it sound quieted? They castrate our voices so we can't breed hope, so... What do you do when you become silent? When the chains binding us are a Lincoln speech as much as a Confederate flag is a Mike Fair shouting abnormality when every coupling of church and state encourages violence amongst the divided in you. Sell yourself out for a peace of mind you will never receive. This nation bleeds every color but red. We tend to forget we are all the same, even if we look differently, even if we love differently. When will we overturn this land on pure white house and stop black marketing our souls to the Republican good? We have seen how courage can quickly become silence. That strength is in standing even with so many bullets in our back that corruption is not skin based. Yet soul amplifying in true colors were never so ugly. What will you do when you've become the straw that breaks this movement's back and nobody forgives you? Because you cannot stop a people, you cannot halt justice, you can only anger it. brother is 11. A little boy as tall as I am with sunburst eyes and kisses from my cheeks. And he has grown up too fast, y'all. Learning to stitch his fists against anyone's jaw that promises him a good fight or threatens his manhood. And he's getting too big for his britches. But he's still too young. Having violence shoved down his throat and his fingers being taught to tickle the trigger of a gun and draw a stranger's blood. His skin is as white as the eggshells I walk on around him. His adolescent mouth has spit hatred and ignorance into the air too quickly for his teeth to catch like all faggots should be sent to one island and blown into non-existence. Or all blacks are poor and we should gun down a hand moving too quickly. Breathing out all of the poison his peers have injected into his brain. I remember being his age. Hearing my great-grandfather call another human being a porch monkey. Saying his hands itched to teach that black right. Telling me that crows and doves should never mix and we aren't living the way God intended. I'm grown now, learning all too quickly that lives can be taken for no reason at all, that a child as young as 11 can learn to hate someone based on their sexuality or skin color like I have never taught him how to love, that a child I rock to sleep can be a calm part of the, of the problem because it's easier than finding a solution, that we sure as hell are not living the way the God I have come to know ever intended. My brother, please never mistake your color for savior. Remember that I am your sister and we are different shades, but I still hold half of your DNA and we still bleed the same color. Remember that you are a little boy, one who is blessed to not have to worry about losing his life and that that does not give you the power to choose who loses theirs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give us a lot of flowers. Okay, 
so I am saving. So we drove, I don't know if we went up or down, down from uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina. So I'm excited to be here. I'm going to I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm going to do some reading. Um, usually I, I perform, I'm going to do something that kind of gives a perspective of why I've decided to, to go on what I'm calling the resignation tour. Um, I recently left a, a salary position to, to work as a contractor. So I'm a, I'm a child therapist. And um, for lots of reasons, I was feeling pulled to, to kind of get more into a little freedom in, in that sense. And I have a poem that, that talks about that. Um, but before we get started, I, I've been doing this at every show I've been going to. It's a group poem. So the way this works is I'm, oh, I just threw every, I'm sorry. I'm going to send around, thank you very much. I'm going to send around this notebook, and it starts out with I am, okay? I want everybody to add to this throughout the feature, and I'll read it at the end. You do not have to read it. You can write whatever you want on here. I will say it. Just, you know, I'll say it, actually. I, I've had people put some interesting things. I actually did this with kids. And uh, what was it that one kid said? I, it started out, it said, you know, I wanted them to tell me a lie about the stars, okay? I said, you know, when you write, you're allowed to lie without getting in trouble because it's your story, okay? So the kids, oh, I can lie. And then this child... And you know, you gotta think of the line of work I'm in, so I'm thinking, I'm trying to find this kid at the end. He wrote, the stars can roll a blunt. Oh. Eight years old. Uh, okay. <laughs> I couldn't find him afterwards, like, I need to be talking to you. <laughs> 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 I need to be talking to you. I, I, I was reading it to the entire group, and I got to that line, I just skipped right over and kept on. It's like, this is a problem. So I'm gonna start right here, and if y'all can pass that around while I'm going. This first poem I'm going to share is about the kids I work with. Um, I've shared this here before. Um, this is my second time being here. I love coming here. Y'all are the most eclectic open mic I have ever been to. When I say that, there is everything from storytelling to hip-hop to comedy. Every single time I've ever been here or heard anything about being here. So y'all have a gem. I just want y'all to, to know. <laughs> if you have not been away and going to another open mic, this is special. I love Thank coming you. here. Yeah, this is good. Temporary placements plague the existence of our children. Systems surround them with ideas that their young minds could not grasp like she birthed you, but didn't know how to love you or your father was not yet a man, these children. All the alternatives to abortion that my salary depends on, I am their therapist, God, made it to my life's work to excavate sorrows and help them build whole like building blocks like Jenga. Sometimes our worlds crash down, but I thank God each day because each day I catch their alligator-sized tears. I store them in jars like fireflies. I hope that one day I can mail them to the sorry excuses for parents that left them behind, these children. They live in a world where we foster our children like we foster our dogs. We have holding cells, holding cells, DNA of deadbeat creators. We try to read the written chromosomes on the wall. Sometimes my master's level degree can't make sense out of what don't make sense. These children, they are tried on like new shoes. If you don't like what you see, keep it moving. They're too often easy prey. They chameleon themselves into what you want them to be just so that for once they can be normal. Like the neighborhood kids up the street. The ones they have only known a few weeks. This is why in their adult life a three-month relationship can be deemed a success. Y'all, so many of these children. They wear open wounds of broken promises and carry salt in their pockets so they won't forget what pain feels like. It has been their only friend, the only one to never turn its back on them like we do every day. I cannot take their crosses from them. These are the things they were given to bear. I can only help them exercise the positive they have, strength. Resilience, life, hope the muscles of their heart can someday entertain the thought of love, these children. I tell them about turtles, their armor-like shells, the jigsaw beauty in their backs, how strong those five senses are. I tell them about how mommy turtles bury their baby eggs in the sand and leave them behind, and how when that turtle is born, 
It opens its eyes, looks around, and heads straight for its home in the ocean. I tell them that their hearts will always know what their home is, that normal is a thing that does not exist. I tell them to be brave, be smart, be the things that they are, and when someone accepts them for who they are, those are the only ones worth keeping. I tell these children each day, you, you child, are beautiful. My parents think I'm crazy because, you know, it's like who goes to school and then you get the job and then you work the job and then you pay well and you do it and then you leave. What is wrong with you? That's how people end up home. Like that's, that's my parents. You know, they're scared. So <laughs> they don't know what to do with me. They're, they're, they don't know what's going on. But um, I'm going to share a little bit about why the resignation tour, um, why following your purpose is important why being tuned in to what's in store for you is important. Um, there's so much freedom that comes with doing what you're put here to do. It's so easy. It just comes to you so easy to do what you're supposed to do. The universe left me notice in the resignation notice that I wrote a few weeks ago. I'm not a rookie to the concept of resignation. Leaving something behind to accept something greater, I have never felt stronger called to a task that leads you to ask, what are you supposed to be doing? What will you risk to do it? And how many folks will you set free when you heed your call? Fear can rupture so much more than your dreams. It can grip your heart and hold your soul at hostage. Threaten that debt collections are more important than happiness or your purpose. Float you into a darker abyss than some Satan has ever taunted you with. Are you going to eat the apple or just let the juice drip? I was raised to hold things gently in my hands. Not because they wanted me to be careful and not drop anything, but because they wanted me to be careful and not alter anything. When? Have you ever seen change come from complacency? Revolutionaries have never held on to revolving doors, so dear boss, dear supervisor, dear director, dear master, this is what it looks like to be on the ledge, legs dangling and pulled by forces of the universe where you and I both begin. See, you and I will never be as different as race, class, gender, or power like to make you think we are. I handed her a letter in person because to email her would have been a punk move. <laughs> and I was raised to hold things gently in my hands. So I'm, I'm seated in an office chair across from her, my soul hanging on to the mantra that the universe has spent 28 years teaching me, trust yourself, love yourself, trust yourself, love yourself, trust yourself. But that day, my calm tonality and humble presence had never been so bruised by privilege. Have you ever had someone to talk over you as if your vocal cords are background singer quality? Like you are the fine print that no one cares to read. I wanted to tell her that I am so glad I'll never know what it feels like to be you. She was raised to break things that tried to leave her hands. For some people, when they are afraid they will use their tongue to gunshot wound your spirit, their eyes will become laser beam destroyer. They are trying with all they know to protect that cold mountain of a soul. I learned that I was destined to build greatness on that day. I was also taught that in order to do so, I might have to leave the safety net we are all so accustomed to. We hold on and trust the direction, and we have to trust what's inside of us, but I'll be damned if I was going to hold my tongue. That picture. You better, you better. <laughs> what is this? I want everybody. Y'all follow her. She's getting the mic. Thank you, Golden Harder. You know what I'm saying? Oh, man. <laughs> I like this. I like this. Oh, man. Um, we do thank have you, an amen section here. Yeah, I like, I like the amen section. I like it. Thank um, you for letting me know you were here, by the way. It's my shop. Hey. <laughs> that little buddy. <laughs> Hello. Um. I don't want to scare y'all too bad. I got some stuff. Man, man scary nothing. <laughs> Bring, it. Scare me. Bring it. We ain't got no kids here. Okay. Bring it. Since you asked. I made that mistake. Um. So what happens when you leave one relationship and go to another? And not only do you do that, you shake things up and it's a same-sex relationship. People know what to do. They're like, oh my God, she's really losing it. So this was a poem written for those people.
I enjoy it. I do. <laughs> you know, poetry allows you to talk to young people without them. Like, it's not direct. You can you're just you're go on the stage and say it and, like, it's you, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to say that, just boom, leave the stage, walk away. Yes. <laughs> leave a yes. subliminal message. Indirect. Um, <laughs> when someone tries to hypothesize your pussy, what happened? Hey, I said it. <laughs> Y'all ask That's for it. Go ahead. Let's go. Tell them there is no equation, no rhyme, and no reason for your orientation to orient itself to their comfort level. Mm -hmm. Tell them that their discomfort with your holding her love in between your lady fingers makes Jesus want to overturn tables in excitement. Tell them you did not know that your vagina could be so interesting to the world, so fascinating. <laughs> When someone tries to hypothesize your pussy, tell them you have never seen hatred look so pseudo-savior. So casting of the first stone, you will want to explain to them how you actually do not hate men. You weren't raped, or you were. You were molested, or you weren't. Or your daddy was the biggest, strongest, and scariest teddy bear you ever met, and you love him, or you don't love him, but don't do any of these things. When someone tries to hypothesize your pussy, be all that they have forgotten to know how to be. Be accepting and not tolerant. Be understanding and not just listening. Understand that because of your bold and extravagant being, they are simply trying to hypothesize you're happy. Do not crumble and do not break under their need to know. And if you cry, sweetheart, you let that holy water filter their laser red stairs into rainbow prism. Shine pride <laughs> like a lighthouse for all of your kind to find home, safety, and security. When people try to hypothesize your pussy, ask them if their original thought got lost somewhere between reality television and the Old Testament. Show them how America has never actually had any Christian values. Show them how love will never exist in their small-minded science experiments. Remind them that there is actually enough of sperm and egg left for humanity to go on. <laughs> <laughs> the world is not ending. When folks try to hypothesize your pussy, ask them, when the fuck did your relationship status become subject for their conversation and idle That's pondering? True. Tell them that you didn't know who you fucked made them come. Come to the realization that it is human nature to fear what we do not understand. When someone tries to hypothesize your pussy, offer them a counter hypothesis. Wrap it in love. I love you, Shonda. Wrap it in love and a bow of truth. Tell them truth is, regardless of your worldview, your experience and your perspective. When you see her, know that she is human, blood, bone, spirit, and flesh. When you see him, understand that he is perfectly made in an image of the only God who has never judged him. Truth is, my sexuality should be considered as important as the number of freckles on my left arm. When we're mindful of our own paths, we can get to our own getting so much more efficiently. But we hide our insecurities in the back seats of our minds, and I think that's where the real sinning thrives. And, and for whatever reason, damnation, salvation, and shouting are outshining living and loving. We need to get back to the meaning of this here wavelength of existence. So when someone tries to hypothesize your pussy, sweetheart, you tell them to just walk the fuck away. <laughs> I like the metaphors in that. Like the metaphors. See, if you listen, you understand it's not just strictly vulgar. I did, you gotta listen beyond the words. Thank you for that. Now, there's another one that I have that's pretty in your face, too. But I think y'all had enough. If anybody wants to hear that one, if anybody wants to hear you meet me outside. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm gonna read it up. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Oh, so y'all got people baby. walking out. Let me go on and let people know. I have, I don't know, nobody walking before out. I do this one. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> she all that matters. She's still here. <laughs> I, got two, I got two CDs today, okay? One oh, of them. Two? I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, it, yes. Oh, he doesn't. We no. have more of the two. Oh. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, these are, um, we have two, two different, different kinds. <laughs> one is a CD of myself and our team. Each poet has two poems on it, so it's ten poems. The other one is solely myself. Um, and I actually had that one with me the last time, so some people may already have that one. Um, if you buy one, they're $5. If you buy two, they're two for eight. Okay? So we only have those for sale. Damn near free. Only $8. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And we take, we take debit, we take, uh, uh, WIC, 
We take. Uh, <laughs> what is? EBT. EBT. Yo. You know, the closest you can get to it. I don't. If you want to see, come talk to me. Okay, just come talk to me. EBT though. Um. <laughs> you gotta eat. You gotta eat. That's real talk. How many people in here love the grandma? Oh. Grandmas, grandmas, yeah. grandmas. Me and my grandma, we have a love-hate relationship. We do. My grandma is, I'm from Georgetown, South Carolina. That's low country, South Carolina. Uh, you would come home with me and maybe not understand what she's saying. And it's, it's the oh, Gullah Geechee. Geechee. And, yeah. So I'm going I'm to, this is the poem I wrote for my grandma. I'm still, I'm still learning this, but I'm going to share it with y'all. Then I'll go into the other poem y'all would like to hear. I told her that I loved her. She looked me in my eyes and said, for true? I said, yes, ma'am. She looked away and said, you ain't for no nothing but no love. And I couldn't find it in my heart to be angry with her. See, my grandmother was an 18 hour day hustler with four babies on her nipple and four rocking on her knees. She cooked grits with passion. She served her mister like a king. She's a strong woman, and she has battle wounds that scream love, like love don't live there anymore, and she ain't sending no one after it. My grandmother has fought more rounds than Ali, but forgot how to float like a butterfly a long time ago. Her life has been a replay of 9-11 in the World Trade Center's one. She never knew when the next crash was going to hit. My grandfather was not a quiet man. As a matter of fact, he was known as a leader of the people. She called him Mose, you know, like Moses. And I always found this to be so telling. You know, the parting of the Red Sea. I remember the first time she told me if I used his fist to part the skin of her face, I imagined that it must have looked something like the Red Sea. She told me to dry my face. But imagine if the man who gave you butterscotch was the first person to punch you in your stomach. I was only six. She told me, he ain't for never know how to talk to people. And I found that to be so telling because he preached a Sunday sermon like God himself had taken over his body. I often wondered what God thought of his fist against her cheek. I wondered if her pain was God's will or if God only spoke on Sundays. When my grandfather died, my grandmother cried. I didn't know if it was because she was going to miss him or if she was just happy that he was gone. So yeah, baby, I, I flinch a little when you get angry. I'm a little bit like well-packaged damaged goods. I'm afraid of love in all the wrong places. It's amazing how fear at six years old can translate to a self-hatred so strong that I sabotage your love for me like you're after me when all you really want to do is be here for me. I made a noose for my heart a long time ago. So when you say that you love me, I can't help but think what if you ain't for no nothing about no love? Hmm. Thank you. Hmm. I don't want to know what you're talking about. Um, I, I, my phone's off. Fuck a dude, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, preface. <laughs> this poem, I'm not going to say a lot about what the poem's about. I'm just going to tell you I did this poem in a church, and I'm going to do the poem. Uh-oh. Yep. Uh-oh. <laughs> Because I roll like that. Uh, it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> he fucked her. In a church, though. Church. Is that glass? <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Wait, rewind. I'll explain. What kind of church? I'll explain. <laughs> and let's get back to it. <laughs> he fucked her. Listen and please understand. I said he fucked her. Now I know this does not mean that he loves her and it's apparent that he loves you, has had dreams of matrimony with you as bride by his side, but please understand, sweetheart, simple and plain, he fucked her. Like face down, ass up, and sweetheart, your beautiful face never crossed his psyche, like out of sight, out of mind, you weren't in the least figment of his imagination. Afterthought is an understatement for your presence while he was fucking her. His tongue caressed clitoris and claimed climax like, like the first day he claimed your heart. So you came when called because he earned king status in your heart, and rightfully so. You, you shared your soul to the Russian roulette dose of monogamy to the head, and we, we will not call this cheating. We will call this the choosing. 
the raw dog of reality, you know, the cum shot to the face because he doggy styled your interpretation of true relationship. True togetherness. Truth is, baby girl, sweetheart, love, you can trust me, so now you. You be the image of broken forever's embattled dreams because there is not much worse than when a woman sees forever in a man's face and is forced to face the broken reflection of us so you stayed in the PTSD of infidelity latched to your spirits like, like bittersweet reflections of your history together. Was there anyone else? Did you take her here? Was she in our car, our bed? Do I do this better than she did? And these concerns will latch on to happy home like leech. Suck the blood dry so the ventricles of your children heart prepare themselves for misfortune and love. Y'all, these are the cycles. This is where men is where women grow up to believe that men ain't worth shit. This is where men grow up submitting to their women for internalizing their parents' sins because their mother taught them just how early just taught them early just how little they were worth, taught their daughters to be divas seeking to make men their bitch, and now the roles have reversed. See y'all, these are the cycles. So if you stay, you just know that he fucked her, licked her asshole, sucked her nipples, and came in her goddamn mouth. So if you stay, you had better be willing to deal with it. Now, why was that done in the church? I'll explain now. <laughs> First of all, we are slam poets, and when we travel, and we go to different places, and they told me it's a free speech venue, as this is, I checked with Catherine on the way. She's like, yeah, say whatever you want. Sometimes posts will tell you that, and you don't know where you're going to end up at when you get there. I get there. It's a church. They're using the church as the venue. Talk to the minister. He's like, no, I want you to do whatever you want to do. I believe in the art. That's ah, but I won the slam. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it worked in my favor, but... Afterwards, he said something to me that I've been sharing at different at different venues, and it's to, it's a spark thought, but then also to talk about just the power that's behind the words that we use. He talked about how this poem talks about something that people in the church don't tend to talk about, infidelity or um, a lot of those kind of hidden secrets, and he appreciated the poem for that purpose, and I'll actually be doing that at a Bible study somewhere else on Saturday. Uh, don't ask me why. Things just happen. I don't know. <laughs> so, I wouldn't think All that that right would happen, then. but that's what happened. Okay. So that is that poem. Um, that makes but this, this last piece I want to do, um, first I want to say thank you for having me be here. Um, I love coming here. I love the vibe here. I love the fact that there's so many different art forms here. And I'm now trying to figure out which poem I would like to do last. This is the very last one. <laughs> you said what? You said, why is your last one? one? I, I, was, I was told it's the last one. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you guys a choice. A, a, a kind of strange poem, strange, okay, versus a poem about my goddaughter. About your what? Goddaughter. My goddaughter. Oh. Okay, like, I'm going to let y'all go because I don't know what I want to say. See, okay. that's, that's what I thought everybody was going to say. I was going to say a strange one, but you can go with that. <laughs> okay. And my goddaughter is, um, how many of y'all know Moody Black? Moody Black? That's his daughter. My goddaughter is his daughter. Okay. And um, that is my light. I have no children. And she, she just, yeah, I, words can't express how I feel about this child. There is only one six-year-old that matters to me these days. She's a Nubian princess and a humble soul. Lavender and chamomile are embedded in her lungs. She wears the sun for eyes and her eyelids close for the most beautiful sunset. This six-year-old, her name is Akira. It means ideal and clear. I will never muster the strength to inform her of how this life will never live up to that. So I listen to her and learn because she sees everything so clearly now. She wears the sun in her eyes. We will all have days where a child teaches us the most misunderstood lesson of all time. They will teach you how to love like your life depends on it because that is how they live. They love like their lives depend on it. Mommy can be mom of the year or coked out on the couch, but they will love them like stars love black skies. They love without conditions. They love without sunsets. So when she asked me, 
why me and her godfather weren't together anymore. I searched for explanation like an addict searches for the needle. See, these days, the truth feels like poison in my veins, and there are no euphemisms for me to feed her impressionable brain. But I wanted to tell her that there are things in this world that are simply too complex to understand. I want to say that heartstrings can make the most beautiful melody, and other times, baby girl, you would just hear noise. I wanted to tell her that sometimes hearts grow weak and faint and you hear nothing. Tell her that there may be a day where the grass seems greener and it's not the shit, baby. It's the passion of that gardener, so learn to find someone that will practice patience and persistence in growing you and loving you, but I didn't. I didn't want to give her a reason to not love us anymore, not love me anymore. I have never searched my intentions with the fine comb of an innocence like hers. Questions dance on the tip of her tongue, and her world of imagination should never be infiltrated with grown-up playground problems. So, so I told her that I loved him, and I always will. I told her that she did not have to cry, and I dried her eyes with the same cloak of peace she shares with me while watching silly cartoons. I let her questions play air hockey in my mental. We all live with what ifs as if we ever really find the answer, and I suppose my happiness could be perceived as heartless. I wanted her to know that four walls always hold the sins that no one knows about. So if my reputation precedes me, always remember that she is hearing the stories without the walls. Never take heed to something that's destined to fall. I wanted her to know that I was the same godmother that loved her as her own. And she has this way of stopping the bounce of the hockey puck in my head. She asked me, can I have some pizza? I smiled. Kiss the suns in her head for the thousandth time. I believe, y'all, there was a lesson in that. Thank you. Y'all have been great. Thank you very, very much. And please don't leave without seeing me, especially you. Me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> y'all hold the poem. Thank you. Were you, you going to read this? Yes. That would be awesome. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I get going up here, I forget the stuff I said when I started. I'm sorry. Yes. So the, the way this poem started is I am, and this was the group poem for anybody that walked in. I am too scared but more hopeful than I am optimistic. I am invincible and no one can change me. I am so, so tired but there is no quit in me. I am a priority, my purpose just as important as yours. I am a curious, regretful, nostalgic feeling trapped. I want to go back to 88 and start all over. I am beautiful, although it took me 24 years to realize that. I am free to hope. I am free to hope and grow in grace rather than live in despair. I am motivated. I am inspired by the beauty of it all. I am me. I am love and understanding. I am determined to be everything I can possibly be. I am uncovered greatness. I am almost there, not quite across the threshold trying to deem worthy. I am trying to make up for a less than worthy past by doing my best to be a good man, father, husband, and friend to many. I am... Augusta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all know the drill by now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Safe and Soul and Flower. Lila Flower. Lila Flower. Okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to pass that up, but that's all right. You were close. Half. Um, well, I am sufficiently humble.